So our grandchildren, like Miss Natalie over here, <laughs> have laser-like focus when they're working on Legos or watching something on TV or on their iPad. The rest of the world seems to fall away as they are mesmerized by what they're doing, even the voices of their parents or grandparents, calling them to brush their teeth before bed or clean up their room or somehow reduced to nothing more than a distant echo. Do I hear an amen? amen? Yeah. When someone finally gets their attention after repeating themselves more than once, they try to reassure us that they weren't trying to ignore us. It was simply that they could not hear us. They're so busy with what they're doing, so enthralled in that coloring book or the game they're playing that they just didn't hear, even though we may be standing right in front of them. They can't see us or hear us at all. In our scripture this morning, Jesus tells the story of a man who is also blind and deaf to those around him. As the curtain rises on this first scene of the parable, we find ourselves outside the gate, a gated community. The wrought iron fence rises majestically high above the street, and beyond it, beyond it we see these opulent mansions. We know that people in those home, live in those homes, but we can't see the inhabitants, <clears throat> not yet. Instead, our attention is focused on a man. He's stooped and crouching outside the gates. His clothes are torn and dirty. His beard is full of dirt and flies. Flies are buzzing around his head. He tries to swap them away, but as he does, the robe he's wearing rides up and sores on his legs are uncovered. Dogs try to lick the sores and he has to shoo them away. The man has been there for a long time. He's hungry. He's feeling hopeless. As we watch, the scene changes as the stage rotates slowly so that we can see inside one of the mansions. There's a rich man who's dressed in velvet and fine linen. The sounds of the street and the howling dogs have been drowned out by the beautiful strains of light violins. The dreary day outside has been lit up with sconces of warm candlelight. The opulent dining room is outfitted with sparkling crystal and marble. The table is full of the most succulent and hearty food imaginable. And the rich man sits and eats. There's no dialogue in this first scene. Just a stark disparity. A rich man sits alone at a table feasting, and a poor man sits alone outside the gate, starving, and push, pushing away the flies and the dogs who are his only company. The rich man is so far removed from the poor man that the stage has to rotate a full 180 degrees for us even to see him. The poor man knows the rich man is there, and he sits there day after day, hoping to find something to eat in the trash that is set at the curb. But the rich man doesn't appear to notice that anyone is sitting outside the gate. He doesn't even know that the poor man is there. The curtain falls, and we sit in silence. The end of Act One. The second act begins and as the curtain rises, we see that they are in a completely different world. The large wrought iron fence has been replaced by a deep and forbidding pit. And we realize that we're seeing the afterlife. The rich man is sitting where the poor man once sat, the chasm stretching between him and the two men who sit on the other side. We know he is the rich man because he is still wearing that deep purple robe. In this world, the rich man is still not given a name, but the poor man is, is now called Lazarus, which in Aramaic means, God has helped. Things are very different here in Act Two. In most stories, it's the rich man who would be known and named, the poor man overlooked and forgotten. But here, it's the poor man who is given a name, and it's the poor man who is sitting held in the arms of Abraham. The rich man seems to recognize the ancestor of faith and calls out to Abraham, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, 
I'm in agony. But Abraham merely shakes his head. Your whole life was shaped by privilege and priority. Lazarus deserves a rest. The chasm between you has become too wide to cross. The rich man is persistent. Well, if, if you won't let Lazarus help me, then at least send him to go to tell my brothers. I don't want them to end up this way. But again, Abraham shakes his head. They've been told how they are to act. They have all the resources of faith, the law, the prophets. God has been speaking to them all this time. All they have to do is listen and follow directions. But the rich man begs, please, Father Abraham, I had those directions too, but I didn't listen. I didn't understand. Maybe if they see a ghost, someone who comes back from the dead, right? Maybe if they see a ghost, they will be shocked out of their comfortable stupor and begin to wake up. But again, Abraham shakes his head. If they won't listen to preachers or care about what the Bible says, why would they listen to a ghost? It's important for us to notice that the rich man in the story today is not portrayed as evil. During his life, he does not mistreat the poor man. He, he does not kick him or spit on him. He doesn't enslave him or call the police on him. He simply sits in his home and eats his food while the poor man suffers silently and unnoticed. He's not evil, he is simply blind. Blind to the needs of the poor man. Lazarus. He's also preoccupied with his own needs and desires throughout his life. Lazarus simply fades into the background, unnoticed, even when he sits right outside the rich man's gate. Even after he dies, the rich man is still unable to truly see Lazarus. Just as he overlooked and ignored and was blind to Lazarus's need in life, even in the afterlife, the rich man still only sees Lazarus as a kind of an errand boy, someone who can do something for him, someone who's worthy only to serve him or come to his aid. Send Lazarus, he says. Have Lazarus quench my thirst. Have Lazarus go and talk to my brothers. Even as he sits on the wrong side of the chasm, the rich man still doesn't get it. And so it is with that wrought iron gate that was built to be decorative and to mark out his property becomes in the end a gaping hole. And the separation that the rich man sought throughout his life ultimately becomes complete. But the chasm that could not be crossed was dug not during the afterlife, but long before. As Clarence Jordan writes in his Cotton Patch Gospel, you know, you better be careful how you dig ditches to keep people out. You might want to cross them yourself someday. This parable Jesus tells is, of course, a cautionary tale. It reminds us that we, too, can be blind to the needs of others, even when they're right in front of us. It also reminds us what we have been told through Moses and the prophets the preachers and our Bibles, how we're supposed to respond to those in need. And even all too often, those demands have fallen on deaf ears. But all hope is not lost. Though Father Abraham would not send Lazarus back to warn the rich man's brothers, Jesus has told the story so that we can hear it again today, standing in front of us, speaking at ever-increasing volumes. Jesus has called us to wake up, to notice what's happening, and to respond. Unlike the rich man, we have a chance to decide how our, our, our part of the story will end. We who have heard this parable may want to take it seriously enough that we don't go back to business as usual because we know the truth, and we know that the way we live matters. In fact, it has cosmic importance. We have the power to build gates and walls. We have the power to dig chasms. Through our neglect 
and our participation in unjust systems, through turning a blind eye to the needs of others and a deaf ear to the demands of faith. But there's another way. We also have the power to build bridges, to tear down the things that separate us and build ramps over gaps. We all have to do, all we have to do is begin to pay attention, to see the needs around us, to care for those outside our own doors. We do not have to wait until the afterlife to bridge the great divide that exists between us and others. Because in the end, the story is not about what will happen to us when we die. Instead, it's a story of how we're going to live right now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we admit that we don't always see what you see. The eyes of our hearts are open so little. Our faith at times grows dim. Even though we fall short, we pray this morning that you would help us see. Open our eyes to see more clearly what you see. To grow into a new level of faith that we might overflow with love and compassion because you promised to be with us. Help us to know you more, to walk in your ways with a new resolve. As the song says, sing it with me if you know it. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let's sing that one more time. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you. So Lord, may we see you today and in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. <laughs>